far is Oxford to blame for Britain's problems? Financial Times journalist Simon Cooper's new book, Chums, looks at how graduates from the university have come to rule our country. Toby Young, in his column for The Spectator this week, doesn't quite agree. To debate the topic, Simon and Toby join Spectator TV. Simon Cooper and Toby Young, welcome to Spectator TV. Now, Simon, could you start by uh, outlining your new book's thesis? It's about how Oxford is so dominant in the UK politically and has been since the war. I mean, 11 of the 15 post-war prime ministers went to Oxford. And, you know, these are people from a whole range of different political views. So we're talking Thatcher, Harold Wilson, Tony Blair, David Cameron, Boris Johnson, really the whole left to right of British power. And the book then focuses on the sort of period 1983, 1993, where, again, the people who will go on to lead Labour, including Keir Starmer or Ed Balls or the Milibans are there. The people around David Cameron, who will then lead the Remain campaign, are there, uh, chiefly Cameron and Osborne. And then the people I spend most time talking about are kind of small minority uh, within the wider Remain, let's say, Oxford. The people who will go on to lead the Brexit campaign and now rule the country. So uh, Boris Johnson, Michael Gove, Jacob Rees-Mogg. So it's not that Oxford is a hotbed of Brexit, because Brexiteers are always a minority there, but these are the people who sort of won the competition in our time. So it's about Oxford, it's about the current ruling class and the grip of Oxford on, on UK power. But you do draw a causal link there, don't you? Because as you say, Brexiteers are a minority, but you draw a causal link between the culture of Oxford uh, and what it encourages and how these, as you call them, chums, came to bring about Brexit and rule the country. I don't think there's a strong causal link between Oxford and Brexit. I think there's a strong causal link between Oxford and power, and there has been in every generation. And so, you know, if you look at Harold Macmillan, in some ways he is a proto-Boris Johnson, has a very, very similar path into Oxford, and then their paths separate because of history, because in Macmillan's second year, I think World War I breaks out and he leaves Oxford forever. But I think that this group of people who I'm discussing, who are important because they, they made this huge change in the UK of Brexit and now they rule, they decided to use that power for Brexit. And I don't think that's an inevitability of Oxford at all. OK, all right. Um, Toby, in, you, in your column for the magazine this week, you write that Simon's book contains incitements to class war topped with a bit of wokery pokery. I guess you, get, you don't agree then. Well, um, I should start by saying, Cindy, that um, I very much enjoyed Simon's book. Um, it's uh, a very entertaining read. I devoured it in one sitting. Um, it's full of amusing anecdotes um, about that period. Um, and uh, I think some of the um, stuff um, documenting what went on behind the scenes at the Oxford Union and elsewhere um, struck me as spot on and very well reported. Um, so, um, you know... I, I want to caveat everything I'm about to say by by stressing, you know, what an enjoyable, entertaining read this book is. I mean, particularly for me, because I was someone who was, you know, at Oxford in that period, but I'm sure it'll be of interest more widely. Um, but um, I do have some reservations about um, Simon's um, hypothesis. I mean, he was, I think, being slightly um, cagey there. Um, my reading of the book uh, is that you were very much trying to attribute um, the Brexit project in particular, um, to um, a sort of uh, group of Tory toffs who were typical of Oxford and typical of Oxford in this period. And you, there is this sort of Marxist analysis that it was an expression of class interest, that really it was about this group of toffs who thought they were born to rule, slightly cross about the fact that Westminster's delegated or transferred some of its powers to Brussels and wanted to repatriate those powers so they could then march into Westminster and claim their birthright as sort of masters of the political universe. And I think the, I mean, there may be a, a sort of kernel, a grain of truth there, but I think that um, the problem with it is sort of twofold. First of all, um, uh, uh, just superficially, lots of the people 
who um, led the Brexit project from that generation of Oxonians like Michael Gove and Boris Johnson, even Jacob Rees-Mogg, um, are not exactly to the manner born. They're not sort of conventionally posh, particularly Michael Gove, one of the architects of the whole campaign. So I think there's, there's, there's a slight, there's a slight, and it actually, actually the people who campaigned for Remain from that Oxford generation, David Cameron, um, Rory Stewart, um, George Osborne, Jeremy Hunt, uh, Nick Bowles, Hugo Dixon, were actually a lot posher than the people um, uh, who, who, who were on the other side. So trying to link it to, you know, a sort of fading ruling class, trying to kind of reassert its dominance and reclaim its birthright, that, that struck me as a little bit simplistic and also at odds with one of the kind of um, points the book makes, which is that politics in Britain, big political policy debates aren't discussed with the seriousness that they should be. And this feels a bit like a kind of slightly low blow and ad hominem attack on the kind of architects of Brexit. Not the kind of serious point I thought Mark, uh, Simon wants us to kind of bring up when discussing a big policy issue. But I think the, the fundamental flaw with this hypothesis, and which I write about in my Spectator column this week, is that actually um, remaining in the EU was plainly, in my view anyway, um, uh, uh, more in the interests of Britain's, you know, ruling class than coming out of the EU. And that pattern was, um, you know, ref that, that was reflected in the pattern of votes on, you know, June 23rd in 2016. It was a genuine coalition between, you know, this elite of Oxford Tory toffs, as he calls them, and, you know, vast swathes of ordinary people across the country, whereas Remain wasn't able to put that coalition together, I think in part because remaining in the EU was identified with a particular class, a kind of class of globalists, um, anywheres, I think, as um, David Goodhart calls them. And, 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 and that was really uh, uh, why they lost. So I think he sort of fundamentally misunderstood Brexit and trying to kind of trace it to this group of kind of um, uh, uh, sort of cynical, non-serious kind of Tory toffs at Oxford, I think is a little bit simplistic. Simon? I would take issue with some of the things that Toby said there. I mean, this is not a book that tries to explain why 17 million people voted for Brexit. They had many reasons. Uh, I'm not suggesting that Boris Johnson manipulated all these people. Obviously, there were attempts to manipulate, but that is, that is what politics does. So the reasons why people voted for Brexit, I think, have been discussed in other books. What I look at here is the people who led um, the Brexit push without whom it couldn't have worked. I mean, if you just had Nigel Farage as the leader of Vote Leave, and the only person saying we must do this, then you get like the 1975 referendum, it becomes identified for the fringe, with somebody who's not seen as a responsible leader, it wouldn't have happened. So you needed people like Johnson and Gove and rees -Mogg. So I look at those people who then, after they win the referendum, they jettison Farage and they become power. Now, I don't call them in the book a ruling class. I call it a ruling caste. I mean, that's the subtitle. Because I don't think, and I say I don't think they're pursuing kind of narrow economic interests in this Marxist way that you accuse me of. I don't think they thought our class needs Brexit to protect its economic interests, which would be a Marxist analysis. I don't think that at all. I think it's a much more aesthetic choice. It's about um, attachment to British tradition. And also, as I say in the book, the idea that we are the people who from the age of eight are destined to go to Westminster and rule the country. And we don't want people from Brussels uh, pushing in on that. And what they want to do with it, with, with their power in Westminster is not so much to protect uh, some kind of vested economic interests of their caste, which anyway is becoming less economically significant as other people gain economic power in Britain. It's a much more about we are the people who traditionally rule the country and we want to do something great with that power, like our like Britain did in the past, and now Britain's becoming this sort of rather disappointing, you know, uh, offshoot of the European Union. We want more than that. They're not typical of Oxford. I mean, Oxford is a is a vast mix of mostly upper class and then middle class people like me and Toby, who um, probably were much larger in number than the group of, let's say, boarding school educated people. And that elite was divided. Yeah. I mean, there were, as you say, there were people like Cameron and Nick Bowles who thought that um, Remain was the way forward for Britain. And so it's not that um, all those people all come out for leave at all. But I'm looking at the people who did come out for leave and were important. And I tried to investigate the reasons why they did. Um, yeah, I think that covers my retort. 
Mm, but Simon, why link it to Oxford at all then? If Oxford produces all sorts of people and if these people that you're talking about are a minority, why talk about uh, what assets the Oxford Union, for example, gives you in terms of debating? Why talk about the tutorial system and what skills that gives you and link it to Boris Johnson's, for example, rhetorical skills? You know, because your, your book is called Chums, How a Tiny Cast of Oxford Tories Took Over the UK. And you talk a little, a lot about the institutions of Oxford as a university and how that feeds into these people. But is, aren't they going to be found anywhere? Aren't they going to be found at Cambridge and other Russell Group universities? If, if they're cast, they could have come from Cambridge. They could have come from other universities or not from university. But the fact is that the entire ruling group of the different factions in British politics in our time, with the exception of Corbyn, uh, Farage, who doesn't really have a party. They all come from Oxford and so have 11, as I say, 11 or 15 post-war prime ministers. So there's something very interesting about Oxford's grip on British power that is worth investigating. It turned out that, for fact, as I explained, in this generation, that produced Brexit, that group of people won. But, I mean, if it had been Cameron, it would still, I think, have been worth a book about Oxford's grip on British power. Mm. And then but, the, Toby, rhetoric, you were at and the emphasis on rhetoric and the tutorial system and the Oxford Union, I think, hugely affects the way that people who end up in Westminster um, rule and talk. Sorry, Cindy, I interrupted. No, no, no worries. Um, I was just going to ask, uh, bring Toby back in. Um, Toby, you were at Oxford during this period. You were contemporaries of many of the characters and people that Simon writes about. Is this accurate? Are, are, are these heady days of what Simon describes what the, you remember? Um, it, some of it is, uh, yes, um, uh, very evocative and um, brought it all back. Um, and uh, as I say, I don't think he, he gets the detail of um, what Oxford was like in those days wrong. Um, but I think his um, rather jaundiced view of Oxford um, and um, of the kind of cult of the gentleman amateur, the fact that, you know, people who go into politics generally don't have a science background or a maths background and that that kind of um, humanities bias, that cult of the gentleman amateur has contributed to Britain's problems and accounts for the fact that we didn't have a very serious grown-up debate about Brexit. And he also, I think, links it to Boris's um, government being at sixes and sevens at the beginning of the pandemic because, you know, they didn't have any sort of medical or scientific expertise and couldn't really cope with something that required a mastery of that kind of detail. I think that's sort of um, a bit unfair. I mean, it's a fairly familiar critique of Oxford and of the kind of British educational elite. And I think it's um, I think it's slightly unfair in that I'm not sure that people like Boris and certainly not David Cameron were as unserious as Simon presents them as being. I mean, to be fair to Simon, he does quote Dan Hannan in the book saying that when he spoke to Boris about whether Boris was going to campaign for leave or remain in 2015, Boris agonised over the decision. And that was, I had a conversation with Boris at his 50th birthday party before he'd fully made up his mind. And I think agonising over the decision is a good way to put it. He did really seem to be wrestling with it, weighing up the pros and cons, recognising that neither option, um, you know, that, that either option was suboptimal. Um, and, uh, but it's, it, it's, it, it, didn't, it didn't sort of suggest that he was just this kind of, you know, dilettante treating it as a kind of debating topic in the Oxford Union. He was taking it very seriously and he takes it seriously because I think at bottom he's a patriot. And I think most of the people who did campaign for Brexit, you know, however much you might disagree with uh, their point of view, I think they thought that it is in the best interests of this country and campaign for it in good faith. I mean, I'll just pick Simon up on one particular point. Um, he, 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 he remarks frequently in the book on the dominance of a kind of handful of elite public schools um, at Oxford. You know, their products are wildly overrepresented at Oxford compared to the products of the school that Simon and I went to. It turns out we went to the same uh, grammar slash comprehensive in North London. Um, uh, uh, that, that's certainly true. And I, you know, I share, I share, most people, I think, share Simon's misgivings about that. Um, uh, but um, one thing you overlook, Simon, is that many of the people you condemn as members of this kind of superficial caste of kind of, you know, um, Oxford Union hacks, 
is that actually a, a, a pretty serious effort was made um, under the coalition government and, and beyond to try and reform British education, to try and improve standards in state schools, to try and make sure that Oxford, Cambridge, the Russell Group more generally, wasn't as dominated as it is by products of a few elite schools. You know, Michael Gove, I think, was very serious about that. Dominic Gove was involved in that project. David Cameron supported um, Gove and cared about that himself. You know, if the, if 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 in if your your kind of analysis, which is that th- this kind of cast of kind of toffs wanting to kind of restore their birthright and restore powers to Westminster, so they could they could then become masters of the universe, and it was all about perpetuating their own privilege. If that's correct, then how do you explain that they made this pretty serious good faith effort to actually um, reduce? the influence of of their class and people from their schools. You know, it seems to me it's a bit one sided. You don't really you're not really quite fair to um, uh, this group that you evidently don't like very much and blame for many of Britain's problems. I mean, there has been a push in recent years, in the last five years in particular, I would say, to make Oxbridge in particular uh, more fair in admissions. And so there's been a huge rise since about 2017 in the number of state school people getting into Oxbridge. I think at Oxford now it's 68% state school, which uh, in the last year, which is the highest ever recorded. I mean, a lot of those people come from the posher kinds of state schools. They um, So it, state school covers a variety of sins. So if you're from a leafy grammar in Buckinghamshire, that's a state school. So Oxford is totally not there yet, but things have got better. I agree that Gove was serious about making British education fairer. I would say the situation as it was when Toby and I went to university was just totally unsustainable. I mean, it's hard to think of a Western, of a European country with that level of unfairness in admissions in the 80s. So only about one in eight people were going to university at all. And if you wanted to do classics, which typically meant that you'd come from a public school, your chance of getting into Oxford in the early 80s was two in three. It really was not that competitive. And just dozens and dozens of people from public schools would come in. So, yes, Oxford now, if I were writing a book about Oxford in 2022, it would be different. But the thing is that the elite is produced 30 years earlier, that um, the people we see in power today come from a past that I've tried to disinter in the book, just on lack of seriousness. I mean, whether you're for or against Brexit, I didn't want to write a book about Brexit is bad, Brexit is good. I'm against Brexit, but I thought it would be incredibly boring to write a book saying Brexit is a bad idea. The whole British nation has had that debate for six years. Everyone's fed up with it. Nobody changed their minds. But whether you're for or against, in the referendum, there should have been serious debates about the customs union, about the Irish border, about a divorce bill, about the single market. How does that work? You stay in the single market, but you leave the EU. What are the modalities of doing that, that was not discussed by either side. And so that, to me, the referendum, whichever side you're on, was not serious enough for the task at hand. Simon, just very finally, I wanted to, uh, something that struck me about your book at the near the end was solutions that you talk about uh, to, to not make Oxford this kind of elite hotbed. Um, and you say that perhaps Oxford should stop teaching undergraduates. So I just wondered all your thoughts about that, because in light of the conversation that we've just been having about how much more diverse it's becoming, you know, full disclosure, I went to Oxford, I did PPE at Christchurch, one of the most infamous colleges there, but I went to state school and I'm also an immigrant who wasn't even born in this country, I had to learn English at the age of 10. Oxford for me was life changing. If you stop taking undergraduates, you know, you'd be denying opportunities to not people like the future Boris Johnson, but people like me so how do you square that well somebody like you i mean here we are three state school people who went to oxford and um ended up lucky but how do you as somebody like you could have gone to another university that would have been great you could have gone to the university of london or uh you could have gone to reading or bristol you could have had an excellent experience because you're a motivated intelligent person then you could have gone to oxford at 22 under what i propose and do graduate work what i'd love to see and i say at the end of the book is an oxbridge for all that we say, you know, you're 35 years old, you didn't go to university first time round, or um, you didn't have a, a good or sufficient experience, you are not from a class that was directed towards Oxbridge, but you're bright, you're intellectual, we're going to take you, and you can have a year at Oxford or three months or whatever it is that, that, that works for you, we have time for. And so we spread the undoubted excellence of a lot of Oxford to a much broader part of the population 
than just this really rather small group of middle class plus upper class people that for most of, even today, for most of the last few hundred years, it's been educating. So would you say not to end undergraduate teaching at Oxford then, just spread the goodness a bit more? Uh, I, I would, I, I, I just think it's the grit, the unfairness of the selection essentially at age zero or age six to Oxford and therefore your ticket to the establishment. Well, not quite in my case. <laughs> not in your case, but um, unusual exception. I, I'd be interested to hear what Toby thinks. Toby. Toby. Um, well, I, I certainly think that, um, uh, you know, more children from state schools should be going to Oxford and Cambridge and to elite universities more generally. And, you know, um, I've, I've spent quite a lot of time over the past um, uh, 10 or 12 years um, trying, to, trying, to, trying to help um, in various ways, um, you know, setting up, um, co-founding four free schools and a multi-academy trust and doing our best to encourage all the children at those schools to uh, aim high educationally. Um, but, um, I mean, my experience of Oxford, I think, in some ways was um, different um, to Simon's. Um, and um, I, seemingly I had a kind of slightly better experience than he did. I mean, that, that may be wrong. I think that's, I just say, I think that's wrong. I had a really good time. I really enjoyed it. I don't okay. feel bitter about it. Go on. I, don't feel about Go on. I, I was going to say that um, uh, I, um, in the group of people studying PPE at Brasenos, um, who came up in 1983, um, there, were, there were 10 of us, I think. And within that group of 10, a huge range of um, political views from a kind of Monday club kind of tub thumper on one on, at one end to a kind of libertarian conservative at the other um, and it, it, it whereas I went to Harvard um, uh, a couple of years after Oxford and within the entire Harvard government department there was nothing like that range of views it was really just kind of people arguing about different interpretations of liberalism. It was Nozickian liberalism versus Rawlsian liberalism. And that was really the only debate. And I like the fact that at Oxford, there was this kind of huge range of different opinions. And it spoke of a kind of pluralism, a real intellectual diversity accompanied by uh, a good deal of intellectual tolerance and uh, real debates about really important big issues. And, um, and I think it would be a shame to lose that and replace it with something kind of more technical, more vocational. I, I wouldn't focused. say technical or vocational. I mean, if you're 35 and you didn't go to university, you're very bright and you want to study Shakespeare at Oxford, great. But Simon, you can't have it both ways. Either an Oxford education is a good that more people should be having, or it's bad and we shouldn't be giving it to anyone. It's not either good or bad. Uh, it can be good and it can be bad. I think that there was a lot of kind of skating over thin ice, winging it, lazing around. Uh, Oxford education wasted on 18-year-olds who took their privilege for granted. But it also is not the highest, one of the highest ranking universities in the world for nothing. You know, it, it, there is a lot of hard work research. and intelligent people going there. Uh, you, ranking is mostly about research. And Oxford has the largest research budget of any European university. It has amazing uh, academics now much more than in the 80s because in the 80s a lot of them didn't even have phds and published in the paper um and it does it does some fantastic research and i think that um the teaching it does i would rather see spread much more broadly to a much wider range of talent all right okay well i think we'll have to leave it there simon cooper and toby young thank you so much for joining spectator tv mm -hmm.